G'day guys, today we're going to talk about the organisation of the Anglo-Saxon military. Absolutely amazing. The Anglo-Saxons were well known throughout history for their administration organ organization and their ability to provide an army, the ability to raise a massive army very quickly and respond to threats had become so amazing over time uh, and it was really the envy of the, the Western world at that time. Rightio, so let's take a bit of a look at the organisation for the Anglo-Saxon military. Anglo-Saxon England is known because it was constantly under threat through both internal and external sources. And really, to understand this better, we need to break it up into at least two major time periods. The first being the year 400 AD to 600, which really covers uh, Anglo-Saxon migration and the settlement of the, the Anglo-Saxons. And the second period being the year 600 to 1066. So during the first period, basically 400 AD to 600, we see the development of uh, Germanic style war bands for each of these kind of uh, Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. There were four main classes of warrior and I do apologize for my pronunciation. I can't speak uh, Old English, so I'm, I'm really going to do my best here. The first was a Gedrith. There were few of these in number, and they were typically known for having a uh, helmet, chainmail, and either an axe or a short sword. Probably a type of gladius or spather sword, uh, which would have been shorter than what became uh, in terms of swords in, in the later years of the Anglo-Saxon period. The next type of warrior was a Gunath. I, I apologize for my pronunciation here. I, I know I'm getting this wrong. <laughs> um, right here, these were young warriors and they were typically armed with a spear shield and sax. So uh, obviously we all know what a spear is. Shields varied in their shape and size. Um, we know that through archaeological records that some of these would have been much smaller and rounder while some of them would have been a bit more oval shaped. The sax is, um, this is a modern reconstruction of a sax for, which currently is on display in the B British Museum. So it's essentially a one-sided knife and this was common throughout the Germanic period. And yes, my sax needs to get cleaned. Okay. Let's go. Uh, a Dugath, which was essentially an older warrior and would have been um, equipped in a similar way to a, a, the Guath. Beyond that, we also know that there existed a number of people who filled a skirmishing type role. Now, this wasn't necessarily a formalised role. We don't necessarily know that there was a distinctive terminology for these people. They would have um, primarily been archers and their role would have been to disrupt enemy formations. It's critical to understand, however, that two things. Number one, that armies in this particular period were very small. So think something between about 30 to 50 or 60 in number, really small armies. Fighting would have been up close and very personal. You would have basically seen the person you killed die and that's how it would have been. It would have been very bloody and very close and very personal. Um, armies like this 
as I say, the war bands are relatively small. They would have been um, very mobile and they would have been able to combine their units together to form larger armies, so to speak. But that was much later in that kind of year 400 to 600 period. Um, so you, you really don't have the kind of bigger fight you might think you did. That said, um, the second part of that is to understand that armies really fight in formations. So what you see in the television series and the, and the movies is never ever a very good <laughs> It's never a good representation of how an army fights. Um, ar armies fight with tactics and discipline. And so if you think you can just run out in front of a shield wall and shout and scream and poke a sword at someone, well, you're going to die real quick and then that's just completely useless and a waste of resources. However, I, I think it's worth pointing out though that in the year 400 to 600, uh, these armies, the Anglo-Saxons, are um, derived from Germanic tribes on continent and they had previously been mercenaries to the Roman army. So I guess there was an intention or a um, belief that they could try and employ Roman tactics and they just didn't have the numbers to it. So going back to the numbers, Anglo-Saxon armies at best at this time period would really have consisted of maybe around sort of 40, 60 or perhaps at tops 80 people. Roman armies would have, like a Roman legion was five and a half thousand soldiers. Couple that with a, a Roman auxiliary legion and you have 11,000 soldiers. And they're able to create such much bigger formations that were far more formidable. Roman soldiers were highly disciplined and they were incredibly well equipped, which the Saxons just couldn't match that. Radio, on to the period 600 to 1066. We still have three major classes of soldier. And again, I apologize for my pronunciation here. The Getrath who was a, uh, a professional and disciplined soldier. This seems to have uh, evolved throughout that period and especially once you have the establishment of the Dane law in, in, the, time of Anglo uh, in the time of Alfred the Great, you then start to come in with the establishment of... Um, there, there was a coexistence eventually between the Scandinavian settlers, because that's what they were then. And remember, a, a Viking is essentially a warrior, whereas a, um, a settler is someone who's migrated and start to set up home. And so these settlers, I, I guess, would have brought their skills into the Anglo-Saxon armies. And eventually... Um, you start to see some Norse influence into the Anglo-Saxons. You start to see uh, a different way of fighting. We don't have a lot of that formalised in evidence, but we do know under Sven Forkbeard and Canute that a lot of this was rebranded into the Huskarls. Uh, I'm going to talk about them in a separate video. However, they were a far more professional well-disciplined, well-equipped, and well-trained unit, uh, and they were able to uh, deploy far more rapidly. And we'll, as I say, talk about that in a little bit more detail in a different video. The second major warrior during this period was the Thane. Now, a Thane was a lord. The Thane had their own feud. Um, we'll talk about the feud in a, in a separate video in a minute, but it was basically a local militia. Now you then had the, the third major category of fighter was um, the, the fear themselves. Uh, so this would have been the vast, vast majority of soldiers. Um, so all Anglo-Saxon free men were obliged to military service, regardless of rank in society. They would have been equipped with a spear, shield, axe, helmet and a sayax. So... Uh, we all, I guess, know what a spear is. Um, shields typically at this period could have either been round or from around the 950s would have been kite shields. Uh, the axe 
would have varied. Um, axes are interesting. You have slightly thicker axes which tend to be more multi-purpose and then you also have um, the, the thinner axes which are far more orientated towards combat. Helmets would have varied across this period but typically we're talking about a, a nasal helm and then of course there's the Sayax which uh, I think most Anglo-Saxons would have had anyway. Um, there were a number of laws that were created throughout this period uh, around the um, obligation of military service and how that worked and the penalties for not providing military service. Uh, we'll talk about that in a slightly separate video but essentially um, these fines were structured according to your rank in society and did vary under different lords and kings. So you could for example be fined 60 shillings as a commoner under King Canute or 120 shillings for a noble under King Canute for failing to provide military service and risk losing land and title if you were um, if you had land and title I guess uh, depending on, on the severity of the crime. There is some evidence in, in the later Anglo-Saxon period for the use of cavalry uh, primarily for scouting purposes there is no evidence that I know of in any form for uh, Anglo-Saxons fighting uh, as cavalry units. So, um, in other words, the same kind of way that the Norman Knights did, but there is evidence, I guess, in, 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 in some ways to suggest that they were used for scouting purposes. So that means that they could use their horses to cover more ground more quickly and to identify enemy locations and strengths, what the disposition of the enemy force might be and what their morale state might be. The primary function of the Anglo-Saxon military, especially during the period of 600 to 1066, was defensive. Um, for a large part of that, for around about 150, 200 years, there was a sustained number of um, attacks by the, the Scandinavian Vikings and then following that um, you had the threat of a Norman invasion which really came, went back as far as um, the early 10 hundreds and evolved obviously up to 1066. We'll talk about that a bit more in some following videos but that's basically it. So there we go guys that's the organization of the Anglo-Saxon military Hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.